Okay. Okay, great. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, regular meeting and workshop of the Hyde Park Town Board. Today is April 19th, and, and it's good to see everyone. Um, uh, so uh, let's open the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United of US, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so um, uh, we have uh, the need for a motion to accept the minutes of the April 5th meeting and I was absent. So I'll look for someone to make that motion. I'll make the motion. I'll second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so uh, we do have the opportunity for public comment on the resolutions. Uh, and I wonder um, uh, if anyone has submitted any comments to you, Donna, the town clerk? No, I have no comments. And Neil, has anyone registered to speak tonight? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so we do have a couple of workshops on our agenda. Um, and I know that- Michael's not here yet. Michael's not here. So I think what we'll do, um, we'll, um, if it's okay with you all, um, just move that to the end of the agenda, giving uh, the planning board chair an opportunity to, uh, to get to our meeting. Perfect. So is that okay with everyone? Sure. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so then what we'll do is we'll start with the resolutions and um, uh, um, we'll start with uh, the um, adopt, adopting local law number D. Resolution 419-1 of 2021. Resolution adopting local law number D of the year 2021 entitled adoption of amended zoning district map of the town of Hyde Park in accordance with the requirements of section 108-3.2 of the town code in section 265-2 of the town law. Second. And um, Donna, could you please do a roll call on that? Councilman Krupnik. Aye. Councilman Ray. Aye. Councilman Woodcock. Aye. Councilman Schneider. Aye. And Supervisor Rohr. Aye. So um, let's just follow up on the next steps. So with this, we'll be um, having this posted on our website in a very short time. Is that right, Neil? Uh, there's already the draft version is on the website. Okay. And, right. and then this gets submitted uh, to the county and the county officially puts it on our e-code. Okay. Is that correct, Donna? Well, I'll send it into e-code. Right. Okay. Yeah, it'll be codified and put in. Great. Right. And, you know, and we're glad that this is uh, is going to be there. It's one of the first things people do when they look to invest in Hyde Park and see what zoning code um, is, a property is located in. And that'll actually tie in uh, closely with our workshop updates. So we're glad to have this finally uh, uh, finalized. Okay. Resolution 419-2 of 2021, resolution authorizing the Town of High Park Town Supervisor to execute a nunk pro tunk agreement with Choice Words grant writer to assist the Town of High Park in applying for the 2021 Federal Community Project funding for the Route 9 sewer project. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 And just to give the community an update, um, the, the, um, as part of the Stimulus Act, they approved uh, expenditures for uh, congressional leaders, and um, including Antonio Delgado, our representative to Congress. And uh, he reached out to Hyde Park and let us know that our project, our sewer project is a good candidate. And um, as many will remember, we had built quite a bit of momentum uh, and we're proceeding 
in the public referendum process when COVID hit and we decided to put the project on hold um, because of course the businesses were suffering uh, with the impacts of COVID. But um, with uh, this funding becoming available and we applied for a $3 million grant, uh, we don't know whether we'll A, receive it or if we'll receive that amount of money, but it seems that um, you know we can kind of take this project off the, cell, off the shelf, rekindle it. Um, we are also due to receive a, an additional 2.3 million through um, the uh, aid to municipalities that, that Congress passed. So uh, combining these funds, this 2.3 million, and uh, perhaps hopefully the 3 million uh, through this federal community project funding, um, we could further reduce the cost to the district members. And so um, we had successfully worked with Choice Words in the past. They assisted us in getting the 1.5 million from the CFA. So uh, we were happy to work with them to um, uh, apply for this funding. It was a super short timeline. And I want to thank uh, Neil for really stepping in and finding all the documents and and providing them and, um, you know, we'll keep our fingers crossed and we'll keep the project moving as to the best of our ability. Do you know when they're going to be awarding this supervisor? No, I don't really know, Ken. Okay. Um, uh, hopefully soon. It was a short timeline. Um, I think we only had about 10 days uh, in gotcha. order to produce it, but, you know, wow. we just checked a lot of the boxes for the community project funding. Right. Um, it had to be a project that had public input, ours did. It had to be a project that had other uh, sources of funding, which as people recall, we have 5.25 million from other funding sources. Um, it had to be a project that was uh, stymied by COVID, ours was. So I think we're really a good candidate. And, wow. That'd uh, you be know, exciting. It would. Yeah. And, you know, as we keep explaining, it's it really is a funding quilt. We're taking um, funding sources from state, county, federal, private, and weaving them together and, you know, trying to push forward on this project. And we'll see what happens. We'll, you know, keep our fingers crossed. We know we did a, a good application. We received... I don't know how many support letters, Neil, was it about? No, 14, 14 or 15 letters. I, I think our application was very solid. It was, mm -hmm. That's great. Thank yeah. you for your work on that. Yeah, so. That's terrific. Yeah. What, yeah. Would, um, what would the grand total, if we were to get these grants and add them to the others, what would the grand total be? So, um, so we already had accumulated 5.25. Uh, this we're asking for three, so that would be eight eight point two five, and then um, adding the two point three, um, we'd be up over the ten million dollar mark, and it is a twenty two million dollar project, um, but you know that would mean eleven or twelve million to be borrowed by the property owners, but the good thing is once the district is formed, we would qualify for a twenty five percent grant funded fund. Uh, funding from WIA, which is a New York State funding source. So 25% of the capital that had to be borrowed. So, you know, we could conceivably bring this project down to a very tolerable level um, for property owners. So, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. And, um, you know, we'll be looking forward to rekindling the public conversation about it, um, bringing forth the um, the revised map plan and report, uh, because we had done some revisions after the last public referendum uh, meeting. So, you know, it's, it's um, onward and upward. We'll, we'll see, you know, we'll see where it goes, but it's never going to get better than this. <laughs> you no, know? Oh, no, doubt. no, no doubt. And something might happen with the infrastructure bill. In yeah. March. So that could add more to the funds. So. More. Yeah. so, you know, and, Part of why uh, we're a good fit is we've done a lot of the legwork, which you know people don't realize with grant funding, you have to really um, get your ducks in a row. There has to be a, an established planning process. There has to be public input there, you know, and we have done all that. Um, you know, just getting the map plan and report and the engineering report, that was a year's worth of labor. Yeah. So, 
hopefully uh, we can, you know, move forward with it and build on the other momentum that we have, you know, this was all part of the downtown initiative. And what we've done is, and finalized tonight uh, with the new adoption of the new zoning map, uh, we revised the zoning to allow greater intensity and density in the town core. Um, and uh, we are uh, working on our second TAP project which is painfully slow, but we are getting there. We have a meeting this week with DOT uh, mm. to further expand the sidewalks. And so this is the third leg. So that's that's the update. That's Perfect. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. This is me, right? Yes. Yep. Resolution. Uh, 419-3 of 2021, resolution authorizing the Town of High Park Town Supervisor to submit a new pro tunk, the 2021 Federal Community Project Funding Application for the Route 9 Sewer District Project. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> resolution 419-4 of 2021 resolution authorizing the town of high park to support the calvert ball preservation alliance application for a hudson valley greenway trails grant to create a historic structure report for the hoyt drive bridge in mills norrie state park second and you know neil do you just want to like speak to this a little bit for um i just want to show a picture of the bridge so people can get an idea um, this is in, in the hamlet of Statsburg, which is Neil's, uh, is Ward 1. And um, that, I mean, Statsburg has such amazing uh, yeah. resources. Yep. I mean, they have the marina, they have the golf course, they have trails, they, we've, you know, just done other stuff. So, Neil, why don't you well, just... So this, I mean, this bridge goes over the train tracks and connects uh, directly to the Hoyt House um, and would be connected to the trails. But I don't know if you can see in the picture that it's, it's blocked off. Um, it's definitely not safe. Um, and it wouldn't be repaired for, uh, for vehicles. Um, uh, very unlikely. I think it would be too costly, right, Aileen? I think yeah. we're just mm -hmm. going for pedestrians. Um, but it just would be so great for that park and for, you know, people to have more access to the river. And uh, it's just, that park is really incredible. Like the more you go through it, there's just all these little hidden gems around there. So uh, I think this is just going to be great for the town. And uh, there's a lot, lot going on in Statsburg. There is. And yeah, there is. Um, so yeah, if people uh, have been aware that, you know, many of the bridges that cross the railroad tracks are, have been closed because of their <coughs> disrepair. Um, one uh, which was uh, provided access to the um, Rogers Point Marina um, was closed and they were able to uh, work with the county and get that bridge repaired and CSX um, because, it's been a long process even understanding who owns these bridges. Uh, no one has wanted to take responsibility because if they do, that means they have to fix it. So, you know, Warren and, and I worked with various people from Amtrak and CSX to really um, advocate that for these bridges to be at least acknowledged who the owner is so that they can be repaired and provide, and provide river access because in Hyde Park, it really is one of the primary ways to get to the river is via these bridges. Um, and a lot of other places they have their access right at, at grade level, but we don't. So it's really been uh, a pleasure to work with Scenic Hudson uh, to advocate for the repair of these bridges. So that is kind of how this grant application evolved and uh, working closely with um, uh, Jeff Anzavino from Scenic Hudson and connecting us the different organizations that would undertake this. So we're hopeful and, and glad that um, A, that they have taken on the initiative. So it's not a grant that we will have to manage because that's very time consuming, but instead that we can just partner with and, and support. And is, is Mills, is the state park partnering with us? With this no, well? no, um, so not. It, but it, it's a state park, right? Right, it is part of the state park. Uh, they have also have a bridge that crosses the railroad tracks. Right. And 
So that is in need of repair as well. And so they're putting their emphasis on getting that repaired. Gotcha. But um, so it's this bridge, there's, um, as I said, they have repaired the one at Rogers Point, thankfully. Um, yeah. There's also a bridge that crosses the rail tra railroad tracks at the Dominican camp, yeah. um, yep. which could really offer another location for Hyde Parkers to access the river if they were able to get that repair. <clears throat> There's a private bridge that crosses the tracks at the Locus, um, which they would like to see repaired. And uh, so- There's also one on the back trail inside the Roosevelt estate. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah. And so they, they have kind of, Cena Cutson is kind of packaging those together. Okay. And if you've followed it at all, there has been, um, resistance to Amtrak's plans to install fencing along the tracks. And so we did advocate with Cena Cutson to include our issue in that initiative. And, and they did, and it's great because at least we were able to get Rogers Point open. So yeah, that's great. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be nice to have that, that bridge open. It'd be um, amazing. Yeah, the one on, uh, cause that's part of the Hyde Park trail system. Right, I would love yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't we join a group also up with, with Germantown and Rheinbeck and the, mm -hmm. uh, the group up there trying to keep the, the, the well, we supported railroad? It. We supported it, but, you know. Supported a resolution, I know. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, our access issues are different. I understand. Yeah. Um, our access issues really, we have very few places where there is the possibility. And pretty mm -hmm. much all of them are accessed via bridge. As a kid, I access. But we have to we have amazing people. access at uh, at Norrie Point, right? And, Good, fantastic. And, and yeah. at Vanderbilt, and uh, we don't have to pay for that. Nope. <laughs> so, that's one of the virtues of our national and state parks. They don't cost us anything to maintain them. So, okay. Moving on, resolution four nineteen dash five of twenty twenty one. We need to vote on that last one. Oh, oh, so sorry, Donna. Good thing you're keeping us right. track all this chatting tonight. Um, uh, do I have a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Donna. Sorry. Yeah. Resolution 419-5 of 2021, resolution authorizing the Town of Hyde Park Town Supervisor to submit a letter to the NYS DEC regarding evaluations of impact on NYC DEP releases to the lower Esopus Creek. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Neil, did you wanna talk about that at all? Um, I, basically there's been uh, discharges that have been creating um, turbidity in the water and it, you know, it brings up all sorts of things that are from the surface, et cetera. And uh, this is very near uh, the intake uh, for uh, the town of Asopus where they get their drinking water from. So, uh, you know, and ultimately we're part of the Hudson seven, which is the seven communities that, uh, that get our drinking water from the Hudson river. And, uh, we work together to try to make sure that, that the Hudson stays as clean as possible. It, it, I think we, the river serves 180,000 people within the Hudson seven. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it would be obviously a horrible thing if suddenly the water had to shut off because of something getting into the system, so. Well, I appreciate that you go to those meetings, uh, Neil. Um, I think you're the secretary, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, working collaboratively with uh, these communities from both Dutchess and Ulster County um, for shared issues, it, it's really been a good, good thing. So yep. appreciate that. It's a good bunch of people. Yeah. Okay, uh, resolution 419-6 of 2021, resolution authorizing the Town of Hyde Park Town Supervisor to sign the, to sign the Town of Hyde Park Monarch Pledge to assist the Hyde Park Garden Habitat in restoring, preserving, and protecting the iconic monarch butterfly here in the Hudson Valley. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 419-7 of 2021. Resolution authorizing the Town of High Park Town Supervisor to execute community distributor generation subscription agreements for the Town of High Park. Second. 
And all in favor? Aye. 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 Do you want me to talk about this a little bit? Sure. Yeah, we talked about it or uh, we had a presentation on it, but we yeah, did. just let, right. if you want to like, let's close the loop on it. Yes, so uh, Richard Maddox from the our Cl Climate Smart Community Task Force came and spoke to us. Uh, and this, th actually the idea was one, one of our, our residents put the idea in my head and I put the idea in Richard's head and he, Richard did all the research to find the right company. And, and basically what it is is that the town will now have solar power without having to install um, so solar panels. So all of our town buildings uh, will be getting its energy from uh, this solar company that's out, based out of Kingston. Um, and the great thing is, is that we save 10 to 12% each month on our electricity usage. So uh, it's that's a great, great, great savings for the town. And it's also just a great thing to do for the environment. Great. Well, Good. So, and we'll have more information on the website about that and sort of how uh, any, because basically anybody in town, if you don't have solar panels, you can sign up with this program. So we'll have information and the town benefits if, uh, if we get a referral from you, so. That's great. Yep. A win-win. Yes. Resolution 419-8 of 2021. Resolution authorizing the Town of High Park Town Board to approve vacation carryover for the Town of High Park Police Assistant, Danielle Erickson. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 419-9 of 2021. Resolution authorizing the Town of Hyde Park Town Supervisor to execute the Crisis Intervention Shared Services Agreement among the County of Dutchess, the Town of Hyde Park, and other municipalities within Dutchess County. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Resolution 419-10 of 2021. Resolution authorizing the Town of Hyde Park Town Supervisor to execute an agreement with the County of Dutchess to provide police patrols in connection with driving while intoxicated laws for 2021. Sorry. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 419-11 of 2021. Resolution authorizing the Town of High Park Town Supervisor to execute an agreement with the County of Dutchess to provide coordinated driving while intoxicated checkpoints in designated areas within the town of High Park for 2021. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 419-12 of 2021. Resolution authorizing the town of High Park town supervisor execute a renewal of the intermunicipal agreement with the High Park Central School District and the town of High Park for the presence of police officers at High Park school events for the 2021 and 2022 school year. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 419-13 of 2020. Resolution, resolution authorizing the Town of Hyde Park Town Board to appoint Evan Rothman to the Town of Hyde Park Recreation Commission. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Welcome, Evan. We look forward to your input. Thank you for volunteering. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, okay resolution 419-14 of 2021. Resolution authorizing the Town of Hyde Park Town Board to revise the wage rates for 2021 for the Town of Hyde Park Recreation, Recreation Seasonal Employees. Be it res oh, that's second. it. <laughs> okay, um, may I have a second? Second. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Resolution 419-15 of 2021. Resolution authorizing the Town of High Park Town Board to amend the Town of High Park Recreation Fee Schedule for 2021. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 So I'm glad to say we are having camp. Um, and that's what those last two resolutions are referring to. Great. <clears throat> yep. Resolution authorizing, I'm sorry, resolution 419-16 of 2021, resolution authorizing Town of High Park Zoning Board Secretary Serena Tuchler to attend the DC Planning Federation Virtual Planning and Zoning Introduction Seminar on Thursday, April 29th, 2021. 
Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Glad to see uh, our employees are continuing with their education. Very good. <coughs> Resolution 419-17 of 2021. Resolution commencing the local law adoption process for local law number E of the year 2021, imposing a six month moratorium on the processing and approval of applications for rural event venues pursuant to chapter 108, 108-28 uh, of the town code. Second. Uh, so just to give a brief explanation, you know, we've been uh, reviewing some of our local laws, including the rural event law, and found that there were some ambiguities. And so the um, purpose of this moratorium is to allow the town to clarify and um, make some adjustments and improvements to the local law. And so the fair way to do that is to have a moratorium uh, in place. So that's, uh, and we'll be introducing a revised local law um, in, in the next month or two and going through the, the public process. Got to vote on it. Oh, sorry. Uh, so do we have a second? We, we already, and all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so have, uh, has our planning board chairman joined us? He has, great. Yeah. Good, okay, so, uh, uh, welcome, Michael. Uh, Michael. Hey, Michael. Your attendance here. The chairman uh, here. And Michael. Michael Dupree, our planning board chairman, chairman, and Herb Sweet, the chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals. And we've asked them to come tonight and be part of our meeting and the event that people don't actually watch the planning board meetings or the CPA meetings, which I know, I know that Michael's got a pretty good fan club out there. So <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to increase it, but um, so, you know, a lot of times um, people don't really understand uh, the planning and zoning process. So it's a good opportunity just to kind of give a, a brief ed education on how it works. You know, one of the um, often uh, heard complaints is, you know, why is the town allowing a second um, um, pharmacy or why don't we have an Adams or why this or why that? And it really just goes down to the um, factual way that uh, land development works. And basically property owners, developers, they come up with a project on a specific piece of property that they own or, or are in contract to buy. And then they put together an application and uh, in, in uh, putting that application together, they have to carefully review our zoning code to make sure it complies. And so, you know, there's, that is how, um, how developments occur. It's not a matter of the town really locating uh, a, an entity and saying, oh, you have to go here and you go there, doesn't really work that way. But, you know, we're so fortunate in Hyde Park to have such a dedicated uh, group of volunteers. Again, it's, they're entirely volunteer. And, uh, you know, our chairman, in particular, Michael, you know, spends many hours meeting with applicants from, from the beginning, from soup to nuts, from the beginning to the end. And, and the goal really is to guide the applications to meet our zoning code and to work through any potential obstacles. So that brings us to the second point, which is the ZBA, the Zoning Board of, of, uh, of, uh, of Review, uh, where Herb Sweet is our illustrious chairman. And so if an application doesn't meet the requirements of the zoning, then the, uh, uh, the next action that an applicant can take is to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals and uh, write an application to them to say, you know, please, can, we, can you waive some of the requirements to allow us to achieve this goal? And, you know, a lot of those are very simple things like setbacks, you know, where you um, want to be able to build your deck a little outside of the minimum setback, or there could be more complicated things like um, an interpretation on what the actual letter of the law means. Um, there's things like use variances, which are very difficult to get in terms of uh, the state requires that a very strict um, qualifications be made um, before a a use variance can be obtained. So, you know, again, it, this planning is a complicated um, 
involved process, but all guided by the written word that's on our website and on our books. So with that little tutorial, I'll turn it over to uh, Michael Dupree and we've asked him to give us an update on all the projects that we have going. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here with you uh, all. And first, your humble servant here begs forgiveness. I actually was sort of wasting time thinking, when's it gonna be seven o'clock and I can go on? I had not realized you changed your meeting time. <laughs> I, I was Yeah, I kind of thought that might be the case. You changed yours too. We did ours over two years ago. So yeah. I think this is great. I just didn't know, I saw my apologies. Yeah, I, I figured that was the problem, Mike. <laughs> I should have let you know. Well, fortunately, a colleague called me. Um, I also want to just say that in general, Hyde Park continues to be very, very fortunate that the development community continues to propose projects of all sizes here. Um, some people or some towns and cities during the pandemic saw a reduction of interest in moving forward. We did not. We've stayed busy throughout, as Councilman Krepnick can tell you, since he is our cameraman, so to speak, and also our liaison. Um, so it's been a real pleasure to continue to work this way productively. Um, so I'm going to first start with major projects because I think that's what most people are interested in. And actually my first starter is something that maybe not everybody is interested in yet, but I wanted to talk about it. It's Camp Victory Lake. This is the very large parcel that's located on the north side of Crum Elbow, right at Quaker Lane. So my first year on the planning board, um, I was barely, I think I was just the vice chair, and this group came to us and talked about a master plan. That's been 16 years ago. This is the Northeastern Conference of the Seventh-day Adventists, which is congregates from five Northeastern states. They're pulling their resources to make this into an actual real camp. Oh, wow. So the first, first thing you're seeing there is phase one, but let me just back up for a moment and say that there's a master plan that they're submitting under discussion. And the items that you can't see but, um, are now included, include high and low rope courses, an archery range, a BMX course, an outdoor amphitheater, and a wellness center. And the reason why I mention these is because the Northeastern Conference has been insistent since day one that they would like to invite, sort of invite and admit members of the community whenever they're having their sort of celebrations. So this would be something that Hyde Parkers could participate in down the line once it's approved and constructed. The very first phase, however, will be the large sanctuary you see uh, shown now on the screen. Uh, that's a really large, large church. I'm going to tell you straight out. It's mm. multiple, le multiple levels. This would be the western facing elevation. Um, this would be northwest from the intersection itself. As you can see, there's some grade changes. But they've done an excellent job. We believe this would be coming down Quaker Lane heading south toward Poughkeepsie. Again, you can see the grade change so that this side shows you more of the elevations than what the other sides do. And this is back to the front. Um, so they've done a lot to break down the massing because uh, the overall size of, the pro of it is big. But for those who've lived here a long time or take that road like me, you'll see once or twice a year during the summer, a really large group of individuals and there's tents everywhere and they're happy people meeting at picnic tables, et cetera. Yep. Right now, uh, under that current situation, you're, everything is weather dependent, and you also have different groups meeting in different locations. By having the sanctuary, which is not just a church for weddings, events, services, but also a gathering place, you can have adults watching youth performances. You can have kind of an interaction of all that goes on site now under the tents, et cetera. They'll be under one central location. So again, this is not something that um, is necessarily going to add to the commercial tax base because it's already off the tax rolls. It's a nonprofit. It's an exciting project, and it's one that I think the <laughs> residents of Hyde Park will benefit from later on down the line. But it is an added good. tax, uh, you know, because when they are here, they do shop, they dine. Yep. Uh, they're, they're wonderful neighbors, so uh, this is an exciting project. Thank you. And if anybody has any questions, just stop me and ask, or comments like that, because you're right. It doesn't add to the property tax base, but by bringing all those people here, which most of the time during the summer, that's 5,000 individuals here. And also, just so everybody knows, this, uh, the Northeast Conference, they inform the police before they arrive. A lot of it is controlled through buses, so you don't have a lot of traffic snarls from cars, and they intend to keep it that way. The next big project is Bellafield. First, to answer what I think a lot of people will be wondering, the hotel should be going vertical shortly. Um, 
He gave that our final site plan approval in December 2018. The building permit was issued in early 2020. Of course, then COVID hit, the lockdown. And just so everybody can understand this, financing hospitality venues has been very difficult during COVID. People didn't go to restaurants. They quit taking cruises. They quit flying. And they really quit going to hotels. Particularly yeah. tall ones, you know, where you are, that are designed to get out and do things in groups with people, like attend the CIA, et cetera. So, um, but I've been speaking, as we all have, to Tom Mulroy, the project sponsor, and he believes he's got the financing set now and he should be able to get started this summer, which will certainly be very exciting. And, and that's have, the picture of the hotel. They've done By a the great way, job with these, with these stone walls and the roads and the lights have gone up. So it's, yeah. it's, it's going to happen. It's nice. Thank you. Um, those stone walls were actually courtesy of yours truly way back when, uh, 14 years ago, saying that we needed to have something that would align it to what the rest of Hyde Park looks like. And that's what we got. But these are even better than I envisioned at the time, to be honest with you. So um, as the supervisor and deputy supervisor know, uh, there's a working group, which is members of the planning board and town board, small groups, um, who've been working diligently with the applicants on a revised concept plan. So what was approved for this originally goes back to 2006 and 2007. Life has changed, not just because of COVID, the economy's changed, lots of things have, particularly brick and mortar retail is not what it used to be because of online ordering. The mm. pandemic has accelerated that immensely. So what the applicant is now proposing basically would be what's called an agri-hood. And by that, I mean different kinds of commercial uses, cideries, breweries, more restaurants, public event spaces, along with retail and services for uh, both individuals of the uh, village that's around it, as well as people who live around the rest of Hyde Park. And that includes also orchards and crop fields. Um, we've been working back and forth, this working group, and that includes Aileen and Neil, uh, along with uh, Ann Weiser from the planning board uh, with me um, and uh, uh, myself. Yeah, but we've been working with their uh, consultants to come up with something that we can, once we get a final revised concept through, we'll have a joint meeting with your board and our board, get this thing processed. Um, but that's, I think, really exciting to see that that's moving forward. At the same time, the planning board is reviewing, it's called an expansion of the wastewater treatment facility. And to sort of be short about this in brief, what was proposed for the hotel is a wastewater treatment facility that serves just that hotel. That's all the gallons of discharge per day that's permitted. The applicants are now coming through to revise what's called a speedies permit. That's the DEC permit for wastewater discharge. They're going for full commercial build out. What this means is that once that's approved and they actually have their wastewater treatment facility expansion in, each time they come in with a new tenant, let's say it's the next orchard, I mean, the next cider, the next brewery, the next restaurant, instead of having to revise that speedies permit for each application, which would be cumbersome, it takes about six months to go through the DEC and Department of Health for that, all that would be obviated. They already have everything ready to go. So it'd just be a matter of hooking the system in and coming to the planning board for an all, another small site plan review. So we're eager to get that move forward. Um, that's in process right now. And we think we'll be through that process in about uh, six weeks. The next large project is Hudson Valley Hospice House. This is a 14 room facility. It's, I nearly showed it up on the screen right now. I hope you'll all agree that that's a really beautiful building. We think it is. Um, this is not the final elevation. The two turrets you see at the ends have been uh, taken off and there's now two smaller little shed uh, cupola almost things on top of the roof but they'll still give the same amount of light that the uh, shed, that the sort of I, I, turrets, I think what we're calling them, but to provide a lot of light. Um, this is a 15,000 square foot facility. We've had a lot of input from neighbors uh, on Dorsey. Um, the Dorsey Lane concerns tended to be mostly privacy and noise, uh, which we've mitigated through landscaping features, um, as well as fencing, uh, plus uh, issues with uh, snow, Stormwater drainage. And we're actually, on Dor we're on Dorsey, Michael. So this is just uh, south of the corner of Dorsey and, and 9G, East Dorsey. It's on 9G. Dorsey. Yeah, this is on 9G itself. It's on Sorry. 9G, but this, but oh, it's on this, 9G. Yeah. As you're facing it to the right, and then behind it is both East Dorsey, because I didn't realize at what an angle East Dorsey went compared to 9G, but I did once I walked the site. Right. Um, stormwater has mostly been addressed. 
They're looking at drilling their wells right now. We're looking at possible or potential impacts to neighbors' wells. Um, but the most sort of exciting thing about this is, is that there is no hospice house facility in the entire county. There's one in Orange County that people can go to, but this will be the first and only one in the county they've chosen Hyde Park. In addition, this creates really good, high paying jobs. Individuals who work here are highly skilled because this is basically a medical facility. Mm. Um, and while you can't see it here, in the rear, there's, a, there's actually a memory garden, a places to stroll. And what's really nice is all the windows from uh, the rooms will look out onto landscape beds, which provides a soothing environment for patients uh, who are basically in extremis when you call in hospice. This so across this is, from uh, like St. Peter's? No. no, this is actually on the east side of 9G, and this is almost directly across from what is now called Hyde. You might, old timers would have known it as Rainbow Room. Rainbow Room. Rainbow. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. An empty lot for sale for a while. The only yeah. thing that the planning board has been sort of upset about is the applicants have gone to great lengths to give us, you know, really, we think, beautiful architecture. You're not going to be able to see it much because the actual aperture opening on 9G isn't that wide. It just isn't. But there will be sidewalks uh, along 9G in this area. There's also going to be at the front, because this is set pretty far back uh, from 9G, will also be a, a bench area, and this can become a bus stop for uh, employees or visitors later on down the line. How many Great. beds would they have there, uh, Michael? This is 14 yeah. room, and believe it or not, that this 14? is the size. Yep. Wow. So there's the final design. If you see the two turrets are no longer there, you can see the two little top, like almost like cupolas. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, it's basically pretty much what you saw all along. So uh, the planning board, as I said, really embraced the idea that this is a building that all of Hyde Park can be proud of. We just wish it was a little more visible. But the nature of this site, the way people arrive and need to come in throughout the day to visit um, loved ones, it right. does need to be kind of set back from the road to guarantee more silence right. and quiet. Oh, yes. wow. The, uh, the one, the one in Orange County, that's in Newburgh, correct, Michael? It is. It is Hoffman House. I've I've been, well, I've had to visit a, a friend there. Um, and that's set back as well. That, the, that facility is. is set back um, in a very quiet area. Um, wow. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Michael, I do have a question. Um, yeah. You mentioned that they will be digging wells. Have they had any discussion with the Water Authority about tapping into uh, the water at Pinebrook? They did, and the uh, Water Authority more or less denied them because it's not in the next zone. Yeah. So that, that's what they first looked for because that'd be easier because the well they're going to, for what they're needing, they're going to have to do about a hundred foot well here. Yeah, because we had always hoped that uh, the Water Authority would take on the initiative of connecting uh, yes. Pine Brook through Hoyt, um, Holt Development Holt, Holt, and then, you know, Holt Road down to the Hyde Park water systems. And I know when they when they would do that, they would need more users, but maybe that's just not in the works yet. But until it is in the works, then Pine Brook probably wouldn't provide a good option because their water system is does not have a lot of additional flow. Right, the capacity is oh, not exactly. adequate for Pine Brook. Right, right, right got it. But well, they did they did look into that immediately. Yeah, because it, it seemed right. like that, a good opportunity, you know, if they had additional users, but you know, actually. Only if it's only 14 units, it wouldn't be, it's probably not going to be a tremendous water user, but in it's any not, case. but there's a lot of cleaning that goes on there. Yeah. Um, yeah cleaning better. from bodily functions, I'll call it. It's cleaning from lots of stuff. So, and they also um, will do a lot of the laundry on site, which there's a lot of washing of sheets, et cetera, there, uh, uh, uniforms. So there's a lot that goes on on that site. But we think this is a really exciting one and we're looking forward right. to seeing it come to fruition. The ZBA, by the way, Chairman Sweet and the Zoning Board of Appeals had to give that a um, area variance because it's only allowed 6,500 square feet, and this is much bigger. Um, but they did so, I believe, justifying it by the fact that there are many, many, many other commercial uses in the area that exceed 6,500 square feet. Well, it's then, also nice that that is really kind of developing as a medical hub, that part of 9G, uh, you know, between hospice, and then you have the assisted living, and then you have the dialysis treatment, it's its kind of a nice area to see that business growth. Really, it's an improvement and, and good, yeah. It, it also, again, these also bring new people to the area, as Councilman Schneider said. When visitors come to this site, they're gonna go, you know what, if it's, let's say I'm staying all day to be with you know my husband, my wife, my daughter, my son, my grandparent. You're gonna go say, let's get some lunch. 
You're going to go use an area business and bring that back to your other loved ones who are visiting as well. Or if you stay all day and, you know, just decide to skip lunch, you're going to go, gee, I'm hungry. Let's get something now. You're going to patronize, I believe, something in Hyde Park. So, again, just bringing more users here from across the county to Hyde Park can never hurt. There are other major projects that were approved uh, in prior times. First, I'll just mention that Crofton Muse, which is the large area that's behind the Moose Lodge, um, construction was started there, and then um, the economy hit in 2007, and it ne really never recovered. Uh, basically, that this proposal, and it's all housing units, this proposal goes back to, if you can believe this, the year 2000, even before that it was discussed. Um, it's been modified several times. They're revising the site plan now for a reduction in 69 units. What was last approved was 319. It's not going to be 248. These are all going to be rentals. Um, but again, we're just in the beginning process of having them revise their plan. One of the things that always stopped this is there was required to be an open span bridge that would cross the Cremelbo Creek to get to 9G. That is very expensive. Open span bridges are not cheap. In addition, the soil in, in, in the creek right there is a little bit unstable, so the pilings you have to drive down will be extra, extra, extra big, just like they did on um, uh, from Elbow when it was repaired around the, around the uh, right. Road area. Same sort of situation. Also, for people who've been driving around and on North Cross Road, you will see that Jeffrey Groves has started land development. That's going to be 57 rental townhouses, very attractive ones, I have to add, with its own water and sewer system. And that's on the north side of North Cross Road. Dollar General, which is going to be one of the I think prettiest buildings, and definitely the prettiest Dollar General I've ever seen. It's stick built and arts and craft design um, on the northeast corner of East Dorsey and 9G in that same area as Hospice House. Should we construct, begin construction soon as well? That's been held up by about a year because of County Public Works. There were some sight line issues as you exit because of the curve of Dorsey and some of the trees that were in through there. Um, but they've made all the corrections and uh, we just passed that resolution to revise the amended plan one more time again uh, for as-built stuff. So it's gonna be pretty easy now to, to sail through. Um, there's also two more solar farms that have started. As you guys would know, because you're the elected officials, we were the first town in the entire county to produce a solar farm array, a solar array law, or solar farms as they're popularly called. Um, you, see, you can see one that's already uh, under construction that's located at the end of, um, now I can't think of the name of the road, but it's what East Dorsey becomes. Uh, Duchess Hill, I believe, estates and- Cream Street. Cream Street. Cream, Cream Street and East Dorsey. Yeah. It is East Dorsey. <clears throat> you, can see that. you can see that underway now. The other two sites that are getting started, one is on um, the east side of 9G across from Micah Thanus' farm. Um, and that will be largely hidden from public view. You won't really see that because it's set far back into the woods where there was already a farmed area. So it's already mostly a cleared area. The other is on Cream Street. If you're driving by, you might not notice it because it's set way back to, it's located. Uh, what you can see right now on the road is a horse and a small horse and small cow farm, I'll call it. Um, but then the slope rises steeply up and the solar array will be put at the very top of that slope. You'll kind of have to do this if you want to see it as you're driving by. Um, but these are both exciting projects because they're contributing toward you know a reduction of traditional energy sources toward uh, better ones and greener ones. And I'm going to end the major projects portion of this on a really positive note. And some of you here already know it because you received the same uh, information, but Asahi Shuzo Saki Brewery has informed the town that they will start construction once again, June 1st. Nice. Again, Good. that was that was occasion because it was very difficult to keep things going if you're in the hospitality business, which they are. Um, as I've pointed out several times publicly, this particular sake manufacturer doesn't really make most of its money off just selling through liquor stores. It's a higher end. They make their money off selling to restaurants, cruises, where they and, and, and say it's something like uh, the Culinary Institute, which is going to be pairing sake with some of their uh, uh, food offerings. That's how they make their money. And that all died there for a while. So it's exciting to see that come back. They'll make then some money it, off this kid. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it won't make then, too much on me. <laughs> and I did, I, I realized that um, we don't have the picture up here because I think that most people have seen it, but I was just talking the other day with someone who said, 
what kind of landscaping is there? And I said, oh, well, there's gorgeous outdoor dining areas because you'll be able to pick up your sake and actually sit down if you want to. They may be they may sell free done bento boxes of food as well later on. But also within that front area, there's extensive um, cherry blossoms because that's very sacred to yeah, Japanese right. culture. Love that. They have both spring and fall blooming, which is more unusual cherry trees planned for in there. Really? So, yep. Along with wow. uh, some bamboo. So you're going, once the landscaping starts, you'll see traditional Hyde Park around the perimeter, you know, good old Northeast stuff. But then as you get in, you're going to be entering into a different culture, a different land, which that's what it's designed for is to appeal to tourists. Because remember, there is brewery you'll be able to tour as well as, I shouldn't hit brewery, you'll be able to taste and tour. Then, as the supervisor mentioned, um, since I was appointed, um, we, the zoning administrator, Tad Moss, and I, along these days with at least, I mean, I hope always two of the planning board members, we have pre, pre-application meetings, I call them, where we first sit down and talk about what the ideas are that people are proposing. I don't always mention those if it's just after the first conversation, because we never know if that's really going to come to fruition. But we do talk about them after the second and third, because it seems like it's kind of gelling that way. So the first um, item I'll discuss, it's still under discussion, but about to enter the pipeline is a project called Farms to You. This would be an innovative market, like a farmer's market, but a retail market, all operating all throughout the year, featuring products from area farms that are all within a hundred mile radius. Wow. The company already exists. Um, I just got off the county planning board, but I served there for 10 years. And the primary function of the county planning board is to actually recommend purchase of uh, agricultural uh, development rights. And I know in talking to the farmers that we spoke with over there, and by the way, this, this doesn't mean that it stays a farm, it just means it can't be broken up and turned into subdivisions. Um, but a lot of their problem was trying to get their market or their, their wares, their products to New York City, to restaurants who would like to buy them. You know, Hudson Valley grown, Hudson Valley raised is a big selling point in New York City. So I heard back then about this woman who started a business where she would come to you, pick up all your goods, and then combine them with things from other farms and then bring them into the city. And when they said it was farms to you, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, and kind of filed that away. And then when they started talking to Tad and I, it took me a moment before I was like, wait, 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 this is that company. So what they're now doing is not just bringing it to end users. They're also selling it. This really helps farmers get their products out. Um, and these aren't just, say, produce. This would be duck bacon. This would be um, trout from one of the uh, trout farms that's located, I believe, outside Albany. There's a lot of different merchandise or product that they would carry. And for anyone who might be watching or any of you guys, if you're really interested, they have a very small shop called the Epicurean. It's a 600-foot retail store they operate in Rhinecliff to get an idea of what they have to offer. They've way outgrown that location. They want to keep it, but they want to have an expanded store. The, they're proposing two barn-like structures. One would house um, some of the small vans that they use to bring the produce back and forth from the farm. They pick up from the farm, then they would spend the night there. Uh, and these vans are air conditioned. They're ventila uh, ventilated and air conditioned so they can keep produce and other things, meats, stuff like that cold. And they go directly to uh, the restaurants the next morning into the city. Um, and then the other barn-like structure, and it would actually be a barn, would be the retail market, and then below that, a commercial kitchen to produce some of what they produce, like the duck bacon. Um, also, sandwiches, soups, things like that that you could get. And again, this would be throughout the year. This is proposed to be located at 1 South Cross Road. This would be between Empire Auto and Dr. Howard Mincer's new veterinary, where you can see the new Gamble Roof with the red building. Um, and... This is, we think this is exciting because this is a way that would uh, allow people in Hyde Park to shop sort of more healthily throughout the year and would supplement the Hyde Park farmer's market. Second project that's in the pipe that's in discussion, and I won't say the name of the company, but it's a construction company that's been based in the city of Poughkeepsie for years. It's well known, very in the industry, and they're considering relocating the entire business headquarters from the city of Poughkeepsie to the former 9G drive-in. What's proposed would be both a commercial structure to house his main business, um, as well as a series of storage units. These are not necessarily aimed at residential storage like Guardian. This would be more aimed at commercial. So for example, if you're a landscaper and you have a lot of equipment, don't have any place to locate you know, to store it, you can rent a place here. It'd be big enough for you to put in anything you need. If you say do construction, but don't have a big enough site or have them, if you want to consolidate to one site, you could have it all put there. 
So drivers could drive in, leave their cars, take the equipment to wherever they need to go that day, drive that back, and then drive home at night. That's really a good this, use for that spot. It's yeah. a marvelous use. We That's think. great. And people <laughs> are always looking for places where they can store their trucks for these. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great that's use a great for that property. Solution. I'll also add that, that there's some unique features to that site, meaning it's really hidden from 9G. It is. You don't yes, really it see is. much of it, right. both by rock outcrops and topography. Right. And um, in working with the applicants, they got pretty serious quickly and hired um, sort of what I'll call consultants we work with frequently. Um, who know Hyde Park, and they were able to design all of it within an envelope that avoids any of the wetlands that are back there. These are mostly degraded wetlands because it was a drive-in for years, but there's still yeah, areas you want to avoid. Um, mm -hmm. So we think that's a great use, and I'm looking forward to them uh, coming up with a more uh, full, full and complete application. Then one that's in the pipeline right now, I mean, they've already applied. Uh, we call it Gleason Family Properties, but for longtime residents, this is also located on the Salt Point Turnpike, almost as soon as you get into town, just past Cream Street yeah. on the right. And this is the former Rimp Feeds, as well as a barn. The barn had been used for retail at various points. You could buy boots, yeah. um, farming implements there. If you've been by the, by the site, it's really, the, the buildings are degraded. And we're very fortunate that the Gleasons, who are Hyde Park residents, want to rehabilitate them um, into something that looks historical, i.e. what they've always been, but uh, purposely reused. So the former feeds unit or building would be, would be an office. And Katie Gleason, who's getting her, doctor, uh, her doctorate as a psychiatrist, is considering using that as an office if she's not snapped up by somebody else. Um, and they would also use the barn itself, we think, for some sort of storage, again, of different uses or even vehicles, um, et cetera. But we think this is exciting because this is one of our gateways into town. And yeah. to see this area update itself and renovate while still keeping the historical structures seems like a great use. One that's in the, only in the discussion phase, but we've gone pretty far in discussing it. Um, this is a, the current gas station and small retail store that's on the east side of nine, just south of Statsburg Storage, which used to be PDQ Manufacturing. Yeah. Um, this has been sold to a new owner. Um, and we're awaiting the application, a final application, because they now are going to deal with Department of Health, trying to find sewer, because the sewer system that's there, the sewer system that's there is too small for what they're proposing. It's not in the right location. And this lets me bring up the other issue that we sometimes have to discuss, which is that because we don't have a commercial sewer system, it does take longer to develop many of these sites. That site was probably last developed in the late 60s, early 70s, and what's permitted in septic and sewer now is not the same as back then, so they're just taking a little time. But um, the building that they saw, it's Jay Deasing, uh, the architect who designed the Dunkin' Donuts that's on nine. Um, he's the architect they chose because someone, a little birdie, told the new owner that if he did good architecture, that would help him get through Hyde Park. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a beautiful building. It's a beautiful building. I assure you, we're all going to be proud of it. Uh, it'll be I really should also nice. add that, that Statsburg nice Storage, that not totally nice change. It's and, gonna, it's, it's, because that gas station is just, it's old and sad. So it's going to yeah. be. I should also add that, Stoutenberg, that Statsburg Storage was also approved for an expansion, and they expect to break ground this spring as well. Hmm. Um, Park Plaza, and I believe we have a slide of this exterior elevation, is undergoing a very significant aesthetic upgrade. I didn't put this in a major project because it's already there, but you can see the refacing that's going on right now at the site. Yes. Um, so it's an attractive dark color, as you notice. The, yeah. tur the, the two turrets are in. Um, you kind of have to envision when you see this that what's below the top image is sort of, that's just the columns and the roof line. That's the new windows you'll see below that. Um, and then you see that's the left or the north side of the site. You can also see the right side of the site. And if Neil goes down one more slide, I think you'll see the, that's it. So what you'll be seeing now is where it says new tenant, that's where Mid Hudson Regional has been. And then below that, where you see the actual Mid Hudson Regional Early Education Center, they are relocating, expanding their business. That's will be um, what used to be Williams. Oh, You'll wow. notice they're adding different windows, et cetera. Um, it's the same entrance, but it's changing in many ways. Oh, There'll great. also be a parking, uh, a playground area that would be just behind this. And they're also looking, there's a shed back there that was used by Williams. It's not winterized, but they're pursuing with Don Westermeyer, our building inspector, 
possibly using that for indoor recreation throughout the year as well, which would be a great use too for that building if they can get it winterized and up um, to from education standards for a playground. Terrific. And by the way, that's also, that not only is, since they've been redoing the exterior, it's also attracting more attention. I won't say exactly what kind of business it is, but we're in discussion with a small retail uh, business that they would propose a building that would be just left or north of the current entry and exit. So basically it would be a bookend to Sue Serino's office, the Berg Stoutenberg house, which Kelly Leibolt, the applicant's consultant represents uh, them always. And I've been discussing for 16 years how great it would be to have a small building in that location so you, A, would not see all that sea of asphalt. More importantly, get people moving around out there to activate the site because when people are driving. If they see activity, you know, lots of activity, they go, hmm, maybe I should go there. What's going on? And you don't see that when it's set so far in the back. You just see you know, the, the empty parking areas and then the cars. So if that moves forward, which I expect it will, um, stay tuned. I think that'll be a great way, to, again, to activate the site. The new town core zoning that you guys passed um, has just allowed a former mixed use building to be converted to a two family unit. That may not seem like much, but in truth, bringing in more residents into the very central core, I need to always remind people that, that will help businesses located there. These new two family uh, uh, renters, uh, leasers, whatever, can walk to Emmy's Delights for sugar and allergen free sweets and savories. They can walk to medical services. They can walk to Antonella's. Um, just anecdotally, I've been seeing a couple that I know who live off Water Tower walk up and down Route 9. And the other day, I kind of pulled in to say, hey, I've been seeing you walk a lot. And they said, you know, we finally realized we didn't have to drive to Antonella's. We can walk. Mm -hmm. And when I said, what do you mean? They're like, it's a mindset. We were always like, honey, let's get in the car and go drive to dinner. To think, oh, wait, we can walk down there. He said, we suddenly thought if we lived in New York City, this would be nothing of a walk. And now it's so pleasant to walk back and get exercise as we're you know, full, you know full stomachs, the, et cetera. But the reason they couldn't walk is there was no sidewalk. Right. No, that's why right. I said, and even though they were they there, the they had to think, happened. I can use these. I can use these. Well, it was just a, it was an unsafe road. So oh, that's, absolutely. that's why it really did work. Yeah. It's and that's why I said. And, you, yeah, and unsafe it, sidewalks too, Aileen. Yeah. And, um, and the back to the Park Plaza, that is the area where we are doing our second tap project. And it'll be really great if we can dovetail this new project with our pedestrian improvements. It, it's really what we're trying to create there. So um, I'm the applicants did ask Pete Sotero for the current they, plans from DOT the and those were sent to them. Design. So they are incorporating the design with what you guys are pursuing right now as well. Great. Then there are a variety of other projects, including some swanky big homes. Um, other things I don't think would interest you or the audience because they're just normal parts of what we do. Um, but I do want to close on one sort of funny issue. And that is, I keep hearing uh, from various people, a conversation, somehow a rumor that Trader Joe's is coming into the old Grand Union slash Amish market. <laughs> so let me put this to rest. No, <laughs> that's not happening. Do we wish it would? Yes. Yeah. But two things. One, Department of Health, because of all the upgrades to the businesses that are already there, you know, Mavis, the new emergency one, um, the new building where you have uh, uh, Domino's, the uh, uh, barbershop, Horizon, Horizon, the barbershop, all of that. Those each, when they were redeveloped, had to have septic upgrades. And there's not enough septic left for Grand Union to become most of anything. Right. Um, the applicants were actually considered carrying storage there too, because you don't have to have bathrooms or just one bathroom mm -hmm. for the manager. But wait, there's Mike, literally so I just want to say though, they have the opportunity to combine those two parcels. If That's what they, it would take. If they choose to do that, and because I just want to hit home this idea that they can do things without without sewer. Yes, it's more complicated, but lots of uh, there's lots of opportunities for improvement of the parcels. Yes, you're going to have to put money into your septic. You may not get the intensity and density you want, but you still there's still lots of options out there, and we're seeing that when people mm -hmm. do upgrade their septics. Like in MED, she upgraded her septic. She was able to produce it. So, you know, again, th that right now it can't go in there because of the way of that limitation. But uh, there are options if they, if they, if they are willing to invest. So it's so basically it's changing the lot lines. It's changing lot lines yeah. so that you could expand over to the right where McDonald's is, or the McDonald's yeah. septic is in the rear behind McDonald's. 
But then there's there the reality. There, there is the reality that Trader Joe's won't come here because our population isn't big enough. So there, right. you know, so and and we only have two lanes. So there, that's the other point. We contacted Trader Joe's when I was on the Economic Development Committee for the town years ago. Aileen was on it as well. Trader Joe's back then said, number one, they prefer four lane highway access. Number two, they don't go to towns less than 30,000. Number three, they've actually looked in the area because they were approached by the owners of the South Hills Mall. That would be a place they would have considered going because, and that was when they were first beginning to upgrade South Hills Mall for those who've lived here a while can recall. Yep. Um, but our demographics, putting it politely, were not what they wanted. We don't have a high enough median income, stuff like that yet. That's improving and it will continue to. But for now, they, they, don't, they wouldn't have an interest in coming here. And they really like that four lane because of the number of deliveries they have to get all the time. So the South Hills Mall location would appeal to them because of its proximity to I-84. Um, and then the last thing that I keep hearing, not keep hearing, that I keep being asked is, what's going on at the old High Park Motor site? And the answer is, is that we've had no discussions, no nothing. As the supervisor and probably most of you on the town board know, um, I believe that Brooke Stoutenberg, the owner, thinks that it's easier to market without that decaying building there. And I am one of many residents who think, wow, that looks great to see nothing there right now. It's such what's an improvement. going on, it looks amazing. Another <laughs> blight does, gone. It does. I love it. It's and I, I also think it gives you a better idea of what you could put there to see now it empty with all the site that's that's available. Yeah. So I've uh, never seen right the now, nothing. at that angle before and lived here my whole life. Yeah, all no, of a sudden the chapel appeared. Oh, it's right here. Yeah. FDR was baptized there, you know. Yeah. Incredible. Well, the owner is asking 2.3 million. So I know. That's, <laughs> that is a, a limitation on, I don't uh, quite have on that. the re redevelopment, but you know, if he can make it happen, uh, we'll we'll be very welcoming. You know, we the, we created new zoning there, the crossroads core zoning to incentivize the property owner. Uh, to build a some sort of multifamily project. And, you know, again, we don't, or excuse me, a, a mixed use project, I think would really be ideal, not just multifamily, but, you know, commercial on the first floor, residential on the second and third floor. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we've had discussions with the property owner over the last several years. There is really kind of nice potential there for uh, him to develop and again, invest in a uh, advanced uh, improved septic system that could house some really nice commercial um, or, or mixed use development. But again, it's investment. I, you know, I think a $2.3 million price tag can be a real deterrent. Um, so, uh, but what an improvement just seeing those buildings down. I mean, congratulations, yeah. Supervisor. I mean, I know how much time and yeah. energy, and I'm surprised you have hair on your head because you were <laughs> you're pulling it out, man. I mean, and, I mean, that is a victory for you and our town to have that blight gone. And, yeah. uh, you know, if he wants $2.3 million for it, I'd much rather see him ask $2.3 million and have a beautiful piece of property than $2.3 million and still have that eyesore there. So right. you sure. know, for when anybody asks me, I just think that's such a victory for us in the town uh, it because it's that blight is gone. So congratulations. Yeah. On yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, it was a lot of conversation <laughs> back and forth, a lot of exploration. Um, and I think we did kind of get him off center uh, in yeah. terms of uh, removing the dilapidated building. So we'll see what the next step is like. I think what we've all learned from Michael's presentation is how much activity and interest there is in the town of Hyde Park and how welcoming we are and how uh, we will work like dogs to make things happen. Yes. And so we'll, we'll see, let's hope. I, I should, and I wanna close by saying to say again, thank you to the supervisor and the administration because I've had the ability to, when we have certain projects to just say, I'd like to have the supervisor on this too which means a lot to applicants, to, to the development community, because when you have the elected officials coming in, particularly the big chief, you know, the supervisor <laughs> saying, well, we welcome you. We're, we're eager to see this happen. How can we help, you know, et cetera. It, it casts everything in a different light. And that's an important thing for Hyde Park. Mm -hmm. uh, so I appreciate the cooperative attitude you, you and Neil, the deputy supervisor have, because I know I call you in a lot and I apologize for that sometimes, but I think yeah. it helps. To me, it's one reason we do this. You know, it's that this is, it has so many ramifications uh, 
for our residents to have an active, attractive downtown and impacts our property values. It in, in, improves our tax base, which then reduces the tax impact to residents. So there's so many good reasons to support positive development. And, um, you know, I've spent my whole life here and I can see, you know, with satisfaction that we are making changes, we're making improvements and, and that feels good. And, and appreciate definitely all the volunteer hours spent by you, Michael, and, and your entire plan. And my colleagues, I, I have to give them a shout out again, because when you go, if you're uh, in a court case, and um, a Trima Plansky will know this, a lot of times judges don't bother to read through the whole briefs. The ones that, that do, the judges that do read through everything that you're submitting as an attorney, they call that a hot bench because they're nervous because they've read everything. And I tell people, um, applicants, um, you're going to have a hot bench with this planning board because, and that's the truth, they do. All my colleagues read everything, contribute intelligent, smart, resourceful comments, and basically make projects better. So it's, it really is a collaborative effort. Uh, I can attest to that. I'm, I'm at every meeting and uh, this, this, that your planning board is pretty amazing. And they always make a project better. And that's something to be really proud of. Well, we certainly appreciate everything. Thank you, Michael. Yes. Thank, thank you, guys. You. Yes. Thank thanks you. a lot, Michael. I'm, I'm going to hop off for okay. super uh, for Chairman Sweet. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Michael. Take care, Michael. Thank you. So now we're going to welcome um, Herb Sweet, <laughs> our Chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals, and thank you, Herb, for uh, being You're with us, Herb, for your patience while we uh, had a long conversation about the ongoing projects. And you know, Herb has been a volunteer for the town for how many years? Would you say, Herb? Since 1992. All right. You count That's them up. <laughs> I don't know if some of our board members were, you know, they were probably just being born back then. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> that would be David. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, along those lines, and Michael was talking about Crofton or Carriage Trail, as it's called now, uh, I recall a, a, an amusing conversation or comment. Uh, when uh, Victoria was uh, uh, starting out, Victoria Polidaro, she was our attorney. And her comment on Crofton was, uh, she said, well, when this project started, she says, I was in the second grade. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and now she has three children and it's still not built. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Some of these projects have a life of their own. And, uh, oh, super bug, that's funny. It's uh, all. It is funny, but you know, and I, and I, and just to speak to that point, you know, Belfield has had their building permit for a couple of years, and you know, people want to understand that uh, frequently, what stops a project has absolutely nothing to do with the town, but more with financing or that the conditions have changed, and uh, so um, maybe at some point the stars will properly align and Croft and Muse may get built out. <laughs> So Herb, again, you know, we appreciate all you do and your board and, you know, you're really, it's more of a judicial review board um, in terms of your function. Would you agree? Well, I guess, I guess you could say that. And uh, it's a, it's a challenge and that's why I've taken it on uh, besides wanting to make a contribution to the town uh, and zoning certainly provides that. Now, Michael gave us a really nice uh, update. It's very interesting myself to hear it all. Uh, what we do is we do we kind of supplement that. Uh, but mostly what we do is uh, of interest to folks in their own neighborhood. Uh, I'm going to give you some hypotheticals and some actuals just to kick it off uh, Aileen did a good job of uh, summing it up. I'm going to get into a little bit more detail. Uh, suppose your next door neighbor had a really great opportunity and he could sell his house to some guy for a million dollars and they were going to tear the house down and put in a, a trombone testing factory. Could they do that? Uh, okay, I'm joking. I got that from a Lola and Hardy movie. But, uh, 
<laughs> I'm sure yeah. Stephen right now is going. Like a little white, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the trombone factory all right trombone testing yes but a ferris wheel would be good yes <laughs> well close in reality maybe your next door neighbor has a couple of dogs and he figures you know what i can do i can make a few extra bucks people go on vacation i can i can take in dogs and i can make a few few dollars uh eh, you know doggies are not going to be too happy being away from home they're going to bark a lot can he do that um uh, Maybe he wants to put a three-car barrage in right up to the property line. Can he do that? Uh, now I'll give you a real a real case. Uh, we had an applicant come in and they wanted to raise pigs on their yeah. half pigs on their half acre piece of property, and the neighbors all had half acre pieces of property, uh, and they'd actually started doing it, and. I can tell you who the neighbors were at the public hearing, which I'll talk about more later, because they were the ones that had little marks on their noses where the clothespins had been. <laughs> uh, spoiler alert, they, they didn't get the, uh, the variants. You need a long, long setback for raising smelly pigs and other animals. So let, let me give you just a little bit of history to kind of put this into context. Uh, you go back to the middle of the 19th century, and about 85% of the population was living on a farm. Yep. Uh, do whatever you like. Your nearest neighbor's a mile away. Nobody cares. By 1920, it was about 50-50 between urban and rural. And today, it's about 80% urban and 20% rural. It's just the opposite of what it was in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, how you measure urban and rural, that's, that's changed a bit, but you get the general idea. We're not, we're not farmers anymore. It's a different country. Well, by 1920, it had become clear that some structure was needed for land use, and that was the beginning of zoning, which could have been called districting, because it's a setting up of different districts for incompatible uses. So they put the factories in one place and the uh, houses in another place and the shops in another place and, and the farms in another place. That's a basic idea. Uh, although today we're talking about village and city centers where people like to see uh, residential and shops mixed in the walking community and all that. That's, that's a, a new twist and, a, and an old idea. And adding to this, uh, were added regulations to assure the, the health, safety, and welfare of the citizenry. Now, in New York, uh, that responsibility was given mostly to the localities with states retaining some authority. <clears throat> the logic was the localities understood the local situation better than the folks of the state capital did. Uh, now, before I continue, I'm just kind of very briefly compare land use law and criminal law. And I see Warren isn't here, so he's not going to get too queasy about Warren me getting into it. this. What's that? Yeah, go ahead, Herb. Yep. Okay, I'm not going to get too deep into it anyway. Uh, I, I think we got to keep it a, uh, you know, 3,000 foot level overview. Yeah, I, well, of course. Well, count on me. I can do that. <laughs> uh, in criminal law, uh, if you tell the judge that the reason you robbed the bank was you really needed the money, it's not going to work out well for you. <laughs> but in land, loose, land use law, uh, one size does not fit all. I mean, the reason for that is each piece of property is different. I mean, a piece of property might have a stream, or it might have uh, some wetlands, it might have some steep slopes, it might be flat. Uh, it might be irregularly shaped. Uh, maybe the house was built 100 years ago, long before zoning, which, by the way, started here in 1961. So you've got to have a way of dealing with this. And when the state began permitting localities to establish zoning, the state also required that the zoning board of appeals be set up. 
And if we weren't here, uh, you folks in the town board would be pestered to death by the citizenry every time they couldn't make a zoning requirements to change the zoning law. And as soon as you changed it, somebody else wants you to change it back. And you, you wouldn't have time to do all the fine things you're doing. So with that background, let me give you some real examples of uh, what's, uh, how this all works out. Let's suppose you've got a, a two bedroom house, uh, baby's on the way, you need another bedroom. So what you do is you plan a new bedroom and you go into the town and you visit with our zoning officer, Tad Moss, explain what you wanna do. And she looks at your plans and says, oh, that's very nice, uh, but uh, you're going to be too close to the sideline. You've got to be 20 feet from the sideline with your house, and you're going to be 15. So I can't send you down to the planning or building department to get a, a building permit. Uh, if you want to do that, you're going to have to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. You'll have to appeal her decision to the Zoning Board of Appeals. You get it? <laughs> okay. So what we do is we publish in the classified a, uh, that there's going to be a public hearing. Uh, we send out special invitations to the immediate neighbors. And then you come visit us and say, oh, I want to put it in my bedroom. Okay. Well, you remember the state? Uh, the state's in the background, but they, they have a lot to say about things. And they tell us that there's certain guidelines that you have to follow in making the decision. It's, it's not up to you, sweet, whether you like it or not. And one of the things that uh, we have to consider is, uh, well, is it possible that you could put your bedroom in uh, without needing as much of a variance or maybe none at all? So we are likely to suggest, well, well, could you put the bedroom in instead of on the east side of the house? How about in the back of the house? And you might say, well, no, no, I can't do that. There's a leach field back there. So, oh, okay, well, well, how about on the west side of the house? I said, well, I, I can't do that. It's, the ground slopes away, and uh, you just can't build anything. So, okay. Well, now we want to hear from the public, uh, and especially the neighbors. And that's not because we want to take a vote or something like that. Uh, it's not, that's not it at all. We're looking for intelligence. We're looking for what do the folks that live there and the public in general know that we don't know. Just like uh, Albany said, you know, those folks in Hyde Park, they're, they're, they're going to know more about what they need to do than we will. That's the same idea. So we collect all that information and we make our decision. Uh, in addition to what I just mentioned, another criteria is that uh, we have to consider is, is there going to be a change to the character of the neighborhood? Uh, is there going to be a, a impact to the environment? Uh, is the change you want substantial? These are all state criteria that we have to consider. Uh, hey, these hey, guidelines. Yes, sir. Can I interrupt you for a moment? Sure. So, you know, a lot of the um, questions that I think most of us get as ward candidates would be, you know, a pool or a shed or they're, they're selling a house and, the, and they realize there is a shed. Uh, maybe briefly, you could explain uh, the the process of how someone gets in front of the zoning board, so that way um, they can get the the zoning board approval. Um, or I guess sometimes it'd be sometimes you don't get an approval, but you know if they have an existing shed and they want to sell their house and it's it's ten feet away, not fifteen feet away. You know, I think that's kind of what you know Stephen sees or I see or or Neil. Um, so I, I think that's kind of some of the basic stuff that at least uh, we try to field here. Happens all the time. Uh, people don't know. And we have applicants come before the zoning board that I didn't know that I had to get this approved. <laughs> and then we start the same pro start the process just as if it's a new application. Uh, I recall an individual came in and uh, he'd, Inherited the house from his father, and 50 years ago, his father had put a swimming pool in, and it was too close to the sideline, and he wanted to sell a house, and so we needed a variance. And he said, no, I was only 14 years old at the time. And I said, 
and and you didn't tell your father he couldn't do that. <laughs> so what is the no, process? These, these things happen. Individual. It's the same process. Uh, the the app the person who has this as built situation uh, applies for a variance to the zoning board of appeals. As I think a, Ken is asking though, how do they do that? So I. I what Herb said earlier, Ken, is they make an appointment to speak with Chad Moss as their first step. However, um, just for clarity though, sometimes what happens is people just go directly to the building inspector and, uh, uh, and um, a apply for a building permit. And um, the way that works is they apply for the building permit, the um, building inspector makes sure the application is complete and then all applications are referred to the zoning administrator for her review to make sure that the, um, the, the proposed project complies with the zoning code. So that's where TAD takes a look at not just the use, uh, if it's a commercial pro project, but for residential, it's, she's taking a look at the setbacks. And um, that is probably one of the most common types of variances that people right. need, would you say, Herb? Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because in, in certain places, there uh, are very few, little setbacks, but, you know, depending on the type of neighborhood you're in, you're going to have, a, you know, a different type of setback. Um, so, or depending on which type of, the, which zoning district you're in. So I think what starts the project either is, the process is either the application to the building inspector or in, in, if someone has had some experience in this realm, because this is not unique to Hyde Park, this is the way it, uh, land use works in New York State, that um, they, if they say they've had this, been through this before, then they would know, well, let me go consult with the zoning administrator even before I get my, my project started. But the truth is that all this information is available on our website at right. this, uh, you know, when you go to the zoning, uh, the E code, and you take a look, you would go, I'm not sure what table it is, but, you know, if you start Googling around and put in, you know, setbacks, then that will bring you to a reference table. And you can really find out a lot of information on your own. And it is advisable to do that prior to even, um, hiring an architect or an engineer. Um, and, you know, not to uh, take away from Herb here, but, you know, one of the issues that we often um, experience is people trying to figure out what is an appropriate sign. And, you know, that again, that's super clear in our, in our zoning code. You go, you, you know, type in the sound sign code and you will have very specific directions and you know sadly some people might go forward without consulting that build have their sign built and then they might be in the position of going to uh, the ZBA for asking for a variance and sometimes um, actually you know people do uh, do apply for even before they build their sign they will go and see if they can get a variance and that often happens with these larger projects. So not to cut you off there, Herb, but I, I just wanted to like interject in how, um, how the process really gets started, because I think that's where Ken, you know, our purpose is to try to educate the public and understand how they can, you know, what, what, we, what our goal is, is we wanna help the public quickly and efficiently while still protecting the rights of, of neighbors. That's the challenge, right? Like, as Herb mentioned, that's why you have the public hearing. That's why you specifically send out letters to all the adjoining property owners so that people can actually weigh in on what happens, uh, you know, in, to properties that adjoin them. A good segue. What we, what we are charged with doing is balancing out the needs of the applicant and the needs of the community. Yeah. And it's, it's a judgment call. Uh, yeah, we get an awful lot of as built And why is that? That's because people don't know that they, they need to go through this process. And right. hopefully we'll get some more educated people because we have hundreds of people watching our meeting right now. 
<laughs> well, it's, I don't blame them. It's the most fascinating <laughs> entertainment on TV, clearly. Well, I, well Herb, I, I know that the zoning board is, uh, is a, a lot of work and a lot of volunteer yeah. time. And, you know, I want to thank you. And, and I know it's a, a family effort with your wife, Barbara, and, and the rest of your board. I, I really appreciate all that you do and have done for the town since uh, 1992. So uh, from uh, the fourth ward, we thank you. Well, thank you very much. Well, actually, we we uh, we do kind of enjoy ourselves. Uh, at a recent zoning board meeting, uh, uh, I, I I made a, a claim that there were actually people that actually tuned into the meeting just to listen to my jokes. No, that's a that's a falsehood. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, well, well I tell you what I've been talking what I've been talking about so far has been area variances. There's a little bit more to talk about. Aileen touched on it, but I'd like to get into a little bit more detail. Hey, Herb, we're going to yeah. you know, keep to a little bit of a timeline. So, okay, uh, well, I'll keep it short. Okay. Uh, I wanted to bring up use variances. Uh, we've been talking about <laughs> setbacks. That's what they call area variances. Uh, what do you do if the use that you want is not allowed? And... Let's take up uh, the uh, trombone testing factory <laughs> and you're the applicant and you go take a look at the zoning and you look at the use chart and you find out, uh, I don't see trombone testing factory here any place. <laughs> uh, a general commercial, that's what it is. It's a, a money-making operation, hopefully. Uh, and you find out, oh, it's allowed, but in the commercial districts, not in the residential district, you can't do it. What do I do? You have to get a use variance. <clears throat> now, in this particular case, the state is saying you're you're doing something that's under the province of the town board, and they're not just giving out guidance; they're giving out mandates. There's criteria that you must meet, and it's tough, as it should be. Uh, for example, uh, you have to prove that you can't use that piece of property <clears throat> for any allowed use. Uh, well, gee, it was already being used for residents. You're going to have to prove it can't be used for residents anymore. Uh, you have to also show that the problem isn't what's called self-created. That means that when you buy that property, you know you can't use it for what you want to use it for, and you're creating the problem. Now, you're, you, you can say, oh, I didn't know. Well, ignorance is no excuse. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. We all know that. So uh, rest assured, the uh, uh, folks, you're not going to have any trombone testing factories next door. And I can say the same thing for the earlier illustration of the dog cattle. They have to be out in the green belt. Uh, you need 10 acres. You need a special use permit. So that's, that's, uh, that's how that works out. And there's one other thing that we do that I want to touch on briefly, and that's what happens when every, people look at the zoning and they say, well, that's confusing. Uh, that, I don't know what that means. Uh, or it's contradictory. It's ambiguous. What do we do? You have to go to the zoning board who interprets the zoning. Uh, I'm going to give you one of my favorite illustrations, and I'm almost through, so don't, uh, don't get too worried. <laughs> and years ago, I was in a, a zoning review committee and I was looking at some of the zoning. And one of the old adages about this business is it's very easy to know what you want, but very hard to put it into words. So I said, folks, uh, look at what it says here about signs. Uh, let me read this to you. It says, signs shall contain graphic content suitable for the intended audience. Does anybody see any problem with that? Well, nobody did. And I said, uh, I'll listen to that more carefully. Contains graphic content. So are, are we trying to support the porn industry? Well, half, half the folks there thought I had a point. And the other half thought I was out in left field somewhere. And that's exactly the circumstance that leads to interpretation. And we can't agree that we understand what's written, what it means. That's what you need in interpretation. Well, we straightened that one out before it got to that point. So that's, that's basically all we do. 
Uh, uh, Aileen mentioned uh, being able to look at the zoning. Let me tell you how you can do that. Uh, get on your computer and go to generalcode.com. Uh, go to the code library uh, and then go to New York and then go to Hyde Park. And the zoning is chapter 108. There's a link also from the town website. And you can, you can take a look and see what all the uses are and what the setbacks are. And you can look at the rest of the town code, too. There's sections in there about uh, property maintenance, uh, uh, noise. There's, there's a lot to it. You can look at the town zoning map. You can see what district you're in. There's a lot there. And if you get enthusiastic enough about it, someday you might find yourself in the zoning board. And I'm through. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, okay. Herb. Thank you, Herb. Always good to see you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Herb. Thank okay. you, Herb, folks. Okay. Alrighty. All right. Bye-bye. Take, Bye -bye. Take okay. care. Okay, so we do have just a couple of other uh, quick updates. I know uh, that we had a fantastic Saturday, um, uh, the Hyde Park Appreciation Day. Neil, do you want to kind of go into that a little bit? Sure. Do I have the right thing up? Yes, yes. Excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the day was unbelievable. We had 95 volunteers on wow. Sunday. On Sunday, we had an extra group. We had the United Methodist Church uh, Youth Group come and do uh, the town hall area. Um, we had, as you can see here, Route 9, uh, the leaves were all cleaned up. Uh, the garbage was cleaned up. Um, we had a uh, Boy Scout troop, uh, number 37. I hope I got that right. Uh, that's, they, that's it, 37, yeah. Yep. Uh, they, they came out in force, um, got some snacks and MEDs <laughs> and, uh, it was just a terrific, here's the, the, uh, the youth group from the United Methodist church. Look how nice our town hall oh, our looks. Nice. Um, they did a really, really nice job. Um, and so many people were involved that the event was sponsored by, uh, the town, uh, friends of Hyde park, the rotary club, um, the, uh, chamber of commerce, and the, of, I almost left out the most important one, the Visual Environment Committee. Right. Uh, and uh, Kathy Lane from the Visual Environment Committee really um, took charge of this and ma just made sure this event was, was safe. Uh, she got all the reflective vests for all the workers who were on Route 9 and 9G and some of the other roads. Um, the Teachers High Park Teachers Association uh, cleaned up St. Andrew's Road. Um, uh, just an amazing amount of, of effort from people of uh, I've Richard Maddox and Pat Lamana his partner. They planted three new dogwood trees across from the stop and shop. Um, I thought I had there, there they are. Um, so I guess the, the previous trees did not do well. And so hopefully yeah, uh, the, the fir trees, they just don't, it's not the right location. I don't think it's sunny enough and I don't yeah. think the soil's acidy enough. So, so let's, let's hope these stick and, and dogwoods love acid. So I think, yeah. Yep. Yep. So it's just, it's just, it was a fantastic day and it's just a great um, turnout and it just shows what, uh, what a town can do when they all come together. And I don't know if people have been outside, but the town looks great. So let's, Terrific. let's, let's keep it that way, folks. Definitely. And yeah, we, it looks great. We're just so fortunate to have fantastic volunteer partners and really collaboration did it. And yeah, you know, how we did an amazing job too, right? How we, how we, you know, our how we worked employee. both shifts, picked up, yeah. picked up bag after bag after bag of leaves and turned it into mulch and on, you know, on Howie's day off. So yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, that's great. So we're very, we're, we're very grateful and thankful and going to enjoy it. Well, it's, uh, you know, what a beautiful time of year too. So, um, and so, um, one other mention, you know, uh, you know, back to Herb actually mentioned our noise uh, noise ordinance that that's part of our zoning code also or part of our town code, and we have had um, a lot of complaints regarding noise from uh, the St. James Antiochian Church on 9G. It's super persistent uh, complaints because it's a, used as a um, venue, a uh, event venue, and our police are there pretty much uh, weekly. Uh, we've had it brought to our attention in the past. We've been uh, trying to find solutions, uh, reaching out 
directly to the property owner, uh, asking him to institute changes that would limit the, the amount of noise that those people who rent the space could produce. We're also taking a look at our local ordinance. Um, you know, there's limitations on, you know, we can, the police can enforce laws, but if, if they're not on the books. So, you know, we're, we're, we're aware of it. We're taking uh, a look at what we can do to address it. We're really hoping for the cooperation of the, um, of the church that uh, it's not their events, but it's more the rental events. So, you know, I think a lot could be solved in, in terms of if that is their, their uh, direction, if they provide that direction to anyone who rents the space. But you know, I did want to know, to let people know that we are aware of it, we're on it, we're working with our police and taking a look at our local laws to see if we can improve them. Who would ever thought a church wouldn't be a good neighbor? <laughs> yeah, but you know, they rent the space out and um, you know, it's for, you know, communions, birthday parties, I don't know. Uh, yeah. And, you know, the people, once they have dinner, they play their music loud and it's, it's really hard for the neighbors. And it's sad because, you know, we certainly welcome the church, but it's not exactly what it was designed for. Um, and it is a problem. So we hope that we can solve it just through communication. Um, Good. But, you know, but, we- And state law does allow for them to have events, to use events. Space as an event space. So it's, that's a, it's a tough thing to get around. But yeah, because you know, there's case law that establishes state law that, you know, these uh, different nonprofits that use funds to supplement their missions, basically, are they're allowed to do that. So it's, it's, an, it's an awkward situation that I think could be solved if with cooperation, and, and that's our hope. Good. So, okay. Well, um, then, unless anyone else has anything to say, uh, I'll uh, seek a motion to adjourn. I make a motion. Second. And all in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Okay, good to see everyone. Take care. Good night, Take everyone. Care, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Good night.